most of my work for the last few decades, really three, four decades, historically was primarily in the world of education, excuse me, it was primarily in the world of business, but uh, since the work we do is really about systems and understanding complexity, that's always been the underlying foundation here at MIT and in the networks around the world that we've helped to bring about, um, it really had nothing to do inherently with business. It really had to do with complexity and how institutions need to evolve in order to be more in harmony or in tune or effective in this world we live in today, which is a world of extraordinary interdependence. And not just interdependence, that's of course a theme we all know, but in some ways the whole rationale for the systems perspective is how is it that we can work together very hard to create these larger webs of interconnectedness and then produce outcomes that nobody wants. That in a sense is the essence of the rationale for systems thinking or understanding complexity. It's not just an intellectual undertaking. But think about it. Look around the world. Who really is trying to produce climate change? No one. I mean, a lot of us are doing it. In fact, you might say we're all doing it together. But it's this together connected in ways that really do not allow us to really understand and have influence on the outcomes. And you can just go down the list of any of the big core global problems, the destruction of ecosystems, the loss of habitat and species, um, water, and the acute uh, uh, challenges of making clean, drinkable water available to all people and all species on the planet. Take any of these problems and just ask yourself the question, who's trying to create them? And the short answer is nobody. But the longer answer, the reflective answer is, well, we're all creating them. Uh, this is the essence of what the system's perspective has always been about. And it, it could be applied at all kinds of levels. I mean, we always say the archetypal system is the family. Look at all the suffering produced in families all around the world and cultures all around the world that nobody intends because we do not really have a, a robust ability to understand and influence the way the system works as a whole. So this has always been the guiding idea behind our work and of course again it has nothing to do with business per se but coming into this uh, primarily with a lot of practice in applying these ideas in the business world has kind of given me a, a very kind of particular perspective about the challenges of innovation in education. First is that we have never ever expected our educational institutions, particularly primary and secondary education, which is where I've spent most of my time, we've never expected them to be innovative. Period. They're, they're in some ways the most conservative of institutions. I don't mean this in a political sense. I mean conservative in the sense they conserve the past. They do what they do because that's the way they've done and they work pretty much the way they've worked for most of the industrial age. If you look at the world of business, it's more and more the case for businesses everywhere around the world that if you don't innovate, you die. Uh, educators would typically say, if you innovate, you die. So it's like the opposite. So we've never expected uh, our educational institutions to really be sources of ongoing experimentation, uh, be trying new ideas, trying new approaches, assessing where that they work, uh, and, and creating new sources of value, new ways of doing things that work better than the old ways, which is the essence of what all that innovation means. Now, having said that, in no way would I expect the innovation in education to occur through the same processes or the same, let's say, uh, incentive systems as they do in business. In some sense, the essence of competition in business is the essence of innovation in business comes from competition. You know, if you don't innovate, you die. Now, the truth of the matter is, at a deeper level, a lot of the innovation processes in business are actually highly collaborative not only within organizations, but across the organizations. But in some sense, the, uh, the motivation is very simple. Uh, you, you're in a competitive environment. I don't think that necessarily is the right kind of fundamental motivation for innovation in education. I think education is a fundamentally different institution. Now again, I'm primarily referring now to primary and secondary education 
Higher education is similar but different in a variety of ways. But my own feeling has long been that the single most important institution for the evolution of society is actually primary and secondary education. That's the fun foundational and innovative foundational institution for each of us. In other words, we first encounter the kind of uh, ground rules, the organizing schemes, the motivations, the pressures, the stresses. We learn everything we learn about how to thrive, survive in institutions in school. And that's literally why schools organize the way it is. We all know the history of the industrial age school was to train factory workers initially. And so it was much more an institution of socialization than education. I'm back to my theme, of course, that we've never expected schools to be sources of innovation. And that's probably fine in an era where the future is going to look a lot like the past. That actually does not describe the era we live in today. Not in any way. But the only thing we can be really confident of is the future is going to look very, very different from the past. Because the primary trajectory of the industrial age past, the, the era that all of us have grown in, grown up in, the era that has shaped our modern societies, the era that over the last four or five decades has literally become the global social and cultural context. The one thing we can say for sure is this industrial age era is coming to an end. It has to. It has profound internal logical contradictions. It's fundamentally in a state of disharmony with the larger living systems upon which we all depend. We can see more and more painfully every day the extraordinary amount of social disharmony that it produces, the extraordinary levels of inequity from the concentration, the extraordinary growing concentration of private wealth, disconnected from the larger needs of societies. So whether you look at an ecological level or a social level, the industrial age model is clearly not going to continue. Certainly not in its form that we've all known it for the last uh, four, five, six decades, the post-World War II era. So if this has to change, it's quite inconceivable to me that it could possibly change without there being deep change in education. Again, particularly primary, secondary education. Uh, higher education, of course, will change as well. But in some ways, that's less a problem because it does not shape the DNA of a society the way primary and secondary education does. What was a wonderful quote by John Dewey that's in the, um, in the report, the uh, Educational Ecosystems Report. Education is the fundamental method of social progress and reform. That was probably about a hundred years ago when he said that. Education is a fundamental fundamental method of social progress and reform. And while that might have been an idealistic idea a century ago, it's no longer an idealistic idea. It's the primary pragmatic imperative that our societies face. So as I've gotten more and more involved in the last uh, 15 years or so, in this primary and secondary education world, it's, a, it's occurred to me that there's two perspectives that need to be blended, honored, they're distinct, recognized as distinct, but integrated in order to create a really different environment for innovation and education. The first is what I would call an inside-out looking perspective. What I mean by that is we look at the way schools function today and we consider the mismatches which are increasingly evident between the way the schools function and the way kids are oriented and the way the world works. Um, school in the industrial age was very individualistic, uh, individualistically competitive. Um, it was all about technical skills. It was all about um, pleasing a teacher. It's a very teacher-centric model. It's a curriculum-centric model. You know, a lot of educators in, in the U.S. call it a, a dip and deliver. You know, like you're dipping out mugs of something and you're delivering them to the students. It was passive. It wasn't active. And it was contextless. In other words, it was really about teachers teaching something that people thought kids needed. It had nothing to do with the life of the child. 
It had nothing to do with the community in which the child lives. With a small exception of uh, residential schools, children do not live in school. They live where they live. The context of their lives is the real school. But school was an artificial institution set up over here in the child's life over here. And this is increasingly at odds with the reality of kids around the world. And kids know that. And lastly, there was never, ever, a deeper developmental purpose. Again, keep in mind the original pragmatic imperative that led to the growth of the industrial age school to train factory workers. Certain basic levels of numeracy and literacy were necessary to fuel the industrial age. It's ironic that although very few of our kids today go to work in factories, the underlying logic is, is kind of the a DNA-like imprint in school. It really hasn't changed. And so all those features I was just talking about are, in sense, the defining features of the industrial age school. Even though the larger reality within which these schools operate is increasingly at odds with this. And so around the world, we see teachers disengaged in teaching. We see students disengaged in learning, even, quote, high-performing students. Lots and lots of studies. They don't see why their school is relevant, you know. Why do I need to go to school to get what I can get on the, online? So this mismatch of the reality of school and the reality that children are growing up in is the kind of deepest I indication of what I would call this inside-out perspective. The model of school simply does not fit and increasingly does not fit the reality in which our societies operate. But you can also look at it from the outside looking in. And that's what the Dewey quote uh, really is suggesting. That if you look at the needs of society, that's what I mean by the outside looking in, starting not with the problems of school as it's currently designed and operates, but starting from the standpoint of what does society need? You might say there's always been two fundamental uh, functions of education, of school, not just the industrial age, forever. Human communities have had ways of educating their uh, children forever. Uh, and the two fundamental functions are obviously the development of the person and the needs of society. So the second is what I'm referring to now as the outside looking in. And when you look at uh, what Mr. Moran was talking about, if you look at his original UNESCO report, if you look at this wonderful report I've been referring to um, from the uh, education Futures Group, uh, in some sense, they're reminding us that it's also legitimate to look at the needs of society and ask yourself, are schools really helping our societies evolve? There's a wonderful question that was posed uh, in the middle of the, um, of the education, Global Education Futures Report, which to me encapsulates this very eloquently. To what extent are we satisfied with the model or models of civilization that we are creating and perpetuating through our education pathways? To what extent are we happy with the models of civilization that we are creating and perpetuating through our educational pathways? That's really the outside looking in perspective. And when I read it, I couldn't help but think immediately of a, of a famous quote of Gandhi's uh, in the 1930s when he was visiting England. And, one of his many trips to England in the early days of his work in India. Uh, and a reporter asked him, I've seen a video of this, it's really quite hilarious. A reporter asked him, Mr. Gandhi, what's your opinion of Western civilization? And he responds, kind of muses, looks a little bit aside, and he goes, ah, Western civilization, it would be a very good idea. So the notion that we kind of understand civilization and perpetuating what we've got is really the function of school is to me a fundamentally flawed notion. It goes back to my comments before. The only thing we can say for sure is the industrial age is going to change. And this model of civilization that is deeply embedded and is really being served by, I love this phrase, created and perpetuated through our educational pathways is in some sense the problem. I think the disconnection deeply, maybe even below a conscious level of students everywhere with the industrial age school really has this as its source. Kids know the world is in turmoil. Kids know they live in an age of profound disruption. 
they can see the symptoms locally they can see the symptoms in the uh, in the mental illness the stress of modern society uh, and their their family and friends okay or they can see the problems globally at no time in human history have children grown up in the world more aware of the state of the world and of course most of the models of leadership they see publicly are not very encouraging so I think deep down children in the world are growing up with a real sense of fatalism that yep we're going faster and faster down this path and yeah I'm being told everything I'm being told is be successful in the school so that I can fit in to this path which I fundamentally see as heading off a cliff I think at an emotional if not a cognitive level young people around the world live in the midst of this dilemma one of our major projects today is with the IB network I'll come back and say a few more words about the kind of projects we're involved with um, but I love this phrase that is, is common within the International Baccalaureate IB network of you know, what, about 6,000 schools in about 145 countries um, to help our students learn how to create a world in which they would want to succeed because so many of the messages that come through to our students is you've got to get an education in order to succeed but I think it begs the deeper question what does that mean if it if succeed means furthering this as it said here this model of civilization that is modernity and we can see heading off the cliff ecologically and societally so what would it take to have an education oriented as the IB people believe around helping students learn how to create a world in which they would want to succeed so what I'm saying now is I think you have two legitimate points of view you have all this you might say turmoil from the inside educational innovators who really are trying to create project-based learning uh, learner-centered learning uh, con context oriented learning where the learning process for the student is deeply rooted in the reality of the students lives that really are more developmental in terms of really developing people not just training people in a set of technical skills you know you might say education is real education there is a tremendous amount of ferment today I believe amongst educators around the world around the, this mismatch of the industrial age model and what would constitute a truly more meaningful education process but then there's this outside in looking perspective also a lot of the guidance we need a lot of the guiding ideas that could really steer this process of innovation really I think only come from looking from the outside in there was another wonderful report that came out just this past I think spring uh, by World Watch it's called Earth Ed Earth Education and if you go back to again uh, Mr. Moran's Professor Moran's uh, seminal UNESCO report of 20 years ago earth identity was one of the guiding ideas so um, the the harmonization of the forces for innovation internally and the imperatives for change externally to me are the key to guiding this process of innovation not in any centralized sense but you might say what are the common set of guiding ideas that could start to connect innovations of all different sorts unfolding around the world so in our own efforts I'll just say a few words uh, to close here about kind of what are we doing because um, I've always been part of, of processes of, of net network building really of innovators people doing this work um, what we've been trying to do in the last uh, five years or so is get connected with global networks that are really engaged in transforming education again primarily primary and secondary education globally I mentioned the IB network uh, I think the IB network is a wonderful model uh, not only is it influential because it has this uh, almost 6,000 programs around the world in all these different countries it is truly global I mean it, it really tr is a cross-cultural network we have a pilot project with the IB network today around what we've jointly come to call compassionate systems what that means is how do we develop the understanding of students primary and secondary age students so students from the age of four or five to the age of 18 19 years old um, 
who really understand complexity, who really do have some capabilities to understand interconnectedness at the level of global issues. Uh, many of the students, schools involved in this are, are focusing on water as an iconic systems challenge. Let me use this project with the International Baccalaureate Network just to illustrate ways I think that this inner and outer perspective can really be brought into harmony. Um, first off is the focus is what uh, we and the partners in the IB, which are 10 pilot schools piloting this program around the world. Now they're in Hong Kong and Mumbai and, uh, and Qatar and uh, Dubai and Switzerland and Spain and a couple of the United States and, and I think uh, Guatemala. So it's very typically an IB program right? because I think real innovation needs to be embedded in a cross-cultural setting. One of the requirements for an education of the future, I believe, is his ability to cross cultural boundaries, and that's why the IB is a great partner. The concept of compassionate systems is a way to integrate all the work that's been going on for the last two or three decades in many countries around social and emotional learning, how to go back to the deeper, I would say, developmental imperatives of real education. How do I grow as a person? How do I learn? How to, how to kind of work more effectively or be more effective in the world of relationships and teams. One of the biggest gaps for the business world, I'll tell you, from the industrial age model is kids don't learn how to work in teams. And yet in the business world, it's imperative more and more in innovative companies everywhere, people work together in teams. And our traditional school models have been paid very little attention, the industrial age models, to you might call it social competencies. But social competencies, competencies are rooted in mindfulness, awareness, understanding my own emotional as well as cognitive reality. So how to harmonize the social, emotional, and system intelligence that we think constitutes the basis for really operating effectively in a world of interconnectedness. So in the IB they call it compassionate systems. Compassion for self, for other, and for the larger systems we're involved with. We always call this the three fundamental levels of interconnectedness that define life. This system, the social system, and the larger systems. But as I said, what really makes it fun to work with the IB is not only are they global, they have some very clear guiding ideas. Uh, the, the purpose of an IB education is, in their words, to develop caring global citizens. So this global mindedness, which is a big uh, imperative for them is is a big stretch because even within the IB network other than teaching subjects what does it mean to develop global mindedness this project is really an effort by them practically to develop curriculum that actually engages students in what they would call globally minded behavior but the third thing that really makes the work with the IB uh, a great example is that they're not just a network of 6,000 schools they're at large they, their footprint is much bigger they have a real value of reaching out, because of course a lot of IB programs are kind of high-end schools, to reaching out in their local context. And I know because I spend a lot of time in China, the people in China pay a lot of attention to what the IB schools are doing. They're very influential beyond their immediate reach. Uh, the school partner in Mumbai is the Aga Khan Academy, classic kind of IB upper-end school. But the project is to work uh, with uh, a whole group of local public schools on issues of water and compassionate systems approach that could get embedded in the public system, the public schools in Mombasa. So this kind of connecting locally to me is absolutely vital. We know a lot about innovation as a social phenomenon and the irony of today in education, or the, you might say the paradox is probably a better word, is it's both very local and global, kind of informed by global issues. Water is a global issue, but water is a very local issue. How do we work together locally? How do we build networks of collaboration regionally to wrestle with these issues, knowing that they are also the same issues, although the particulars are different, the same underlying issues that people wrestle with all around the world? I often remind people that the word global has two meanings. It is around the world, but it's everywhere. Global also means everywhere. So education focused on issues that are really very meaningful for students where they live 
and very meaningful on a global scale. Poverty is such an issue. There's a, a wide range of ecological imbalances like water that are such an issue. Obviously, healthy societies are such an, such an issue. Societies where people really would want to live and raise their children. Back to that IB imperative. How do we help students be effective creating a world that they would want to be successful in? So that's a project. We have another project with the growing Teach for All network, another global network. Um, we have uh, a very interesting initiative at MIT, just started this year, called JWELL, Jamil World Education Laboratory. And what a lot of the MIT work will be around is how do we make the most creative use of technology to support these global networks. I've been around MIT my whole life, and I do think the thing that is most deeply Im embodied in MIT working at its best is a, is a deep understanding of the social conditions for innovation so that technology can actually be successful. A big misunderstanding that's very common around the world is innovation comes from technology. Now I think that's a fundamentally misguided notion. Technology is an enabler. The first question is always, what do you want to enable? And I think if you can get that perspective correct, then the technology can actually be an enormous enabler of the types of innovation that are needed in education. MIT has been a, a leader in the MOOC world uh, now for 10, 15 years. But all of MIT's MOOCs are free, costs nothing, because there's a, a guiding idea that goes back to Ra uh, Rafael Reif, who's the current president, and was the provost prior to that at MIT. He really believes the role of institutions like MIT is to make the very best, particularly in higher education, available at no cost whenever people are ready around the world. He calls it the democratization of education. So that's an example of technology serving a bigger idea. In primary and secondary education, I think that's exactly the same. We know the technology platforms are really, really important. But how do we use them to support a network like this IB Compassionate Systems Network? How do we use them to support a network like is growing through Teach for All, which is now in about 45 countries? So the essence of our strategy has been to find networks that are growing globally, trying to bring about deep, lasting, ongoing innovation in education globally with guiding ideas, not just about technology, but really about the future needs of our society. So that's a lot to cover in a short period of time. A good example of this use of technology is Otto Sharmer's uh, ULab. If you just Google ULab, you'll see an ongoing MOOC that basically involves now about 50,000 people around the world rethinking all kinds of institutions, including education, but it's really a different model of using technology, not to deliver content, which is back to that old education model, teacher-centric model, but actually to foster learning communities. That's exactly what we're hoping to do with JWell, amongst learning communities of educators seeking to transform primary and secondary education. Thank you.